Okay, thank you, Sofia, for this very nice introduction. Um, thank you all for being here, and I would like to thank the organization for inviting me. I am one of those who is uh, uh, new to the Breakthrough Discuss uh, conferences, and I have to say I'm very excited to be here um, and to have the opportunity to interact with you all. Um, I'm almost tempted to take out my cell phone and take a selfie right now <laughs> with you all. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm too old for that sort of things. But uh, um, So yeah, uh, like Sophia said, uh, there's a growing interest in uh, exploring the possibilities of uh, space to to search for alien technology. I, I like to, to say it explicitly, we are searching or we are thinking about searching for alien technology. How cool is that? Uh, that's really amazing. And we are extremely fortunate to live in such times where we can even think uh, seriously about these problems. So um, the search for techno signatures, as we like to um, talk about it, um, we, we like to use the term te techno signature to avoid using the word intelligence, which is very ambiguous and it lends itself to philosophical discussions. We are searching for technology, right? That's, that's the point. Um, and it's not just uh, current technology that is being used by um, an active civilization, but we are also looking for past technology because the past is much longer than the present. Um, this is true now and it will be even more true in the future. Um, so the, the things I'm going to talk about is, yeah. The, the, I'm going to present an overview of uh, a number of uh, possible concepts uh, for uh, space missions with the aim of searching for alien technology. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is something that was, um, it's basically a set of conclusions from this meeting, the Technoclime uh, meeting that took place in August uh, 2020. Unfortunately, this was during the peak of the COVID pandemic, so it had to be done uh, online. But it was a very productive meeting. There was uh, lots of interesting discussions. And this meeting actually was a follow-up um, of the 2018 uh, NASA Techno Signature Workshop, a very, also a very interesting meeting. And this is, these meetings were ultimately motivated by the uh, recognition that the exoplanet science has advanced to the point that now there's unique opportunities to search for techno signatures. Uh, there's new windows that are opening. And you know, in science, whenever a new window open, you have to look, you have to, you have to see what's out there because there's always the potential for groundbreaking discoveries. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a really exciting thing that, that we have nowadays. We have this opportunity with all these exoplanets that we are discovering and all the um, exciting uh, science that is being done for the first time we're in a position to look for life and perhaps look for intelligence. Um, so this was the motivation and what I'm going to present is basically, like I said, a summary of, of this meeting that was, um, it was written up in this paper uh, that has an overview of a bunch of different uh, possible missions that one could conceive. Um, the, the, actually, the, the paper starts with a definition of a um, quantitative scale <clears throat> to, to think about techno signatures, because in science you always have to be quantitative. Uh, we have the nine axes of merit uh, that were introduced by Sophia in this uh, 2018 workshop. And here in this paper, we introduce another, um, another parameter to think about techno signatures, which is this ICHNO scale. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. If I have time at the end uh, of this talk, I will uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit more about this diagram. But ichnos is a Greek word that means footprint. Um, so this parameter, it basically measures the size of the footprint of a given techno signature. It means how um, prominent this techno signature is, how um, detectable it is compared, for instance, to current human level. So uh, a probe, an alien probe uh, that crashed on the moon will have an ICHNO scale close to one because it's close to current human technology, whereas the Dyson sphere will have an, ignos an ICHNO sphere that is many orders of magnitude beyond uh, human technology. So this, this gives us another way of looking at techno signatures in a quantitative way because the whole point of this is at some point we expect that there will be an interest to, um, to promote a space mission 
with the main purpose of searching for techno signatures. And at that point, we'll have to discuss what kind of techno signatures we want to look for, how to prioritize things. And, and it's good to have um, to, you know, not have to improvise, to have thought about all these problems in advance. So we, we should um, start thinking about these, um, these questions. Um, so let me start with one of the most exciting uh, things that are happening is that we are starting to realize that we can look at, um, well, not realize, we, we are starting to, to analyze the atmospheres of some exoplanets. Uh, that's a fact. Uh, and with the, with the James Webb, uh, we're going to take this a step further. But one of the things we are starting to realize is that, is that we can look for in the, sorry, um, industrial um, contamination. Uh, we can start to look for pollution in uh, alien planets. And um, with the James Webb, we can look for um, NO2, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and CFCs at a level with an ICNOS scale of 10, which means uh, about 10 times uh, current human contamination. Uh, and in the future, with a telescope like uh, Louvoir, the, the large ultraviolet optical and infrared observatory, which is a, a plan for a future telescope larger than the James Webb, um, we can actually look for current human levels of industrial pollution in exoplanet atmosphere. So this is, I think, a very exciting development and something that must be kept in mind. Um, and and this, is, this is great, uh, but this is not really what we were um, thinking about in this meeting, because this is uh, the kind of science that you can, uh, this is the study that you can do when you piggyback on um, instrumentation that has been developed for other purposes. Although James Webb and Louvoir are fairly general, they can be used for SETI, they can be used for technosignature research. Uh, but what we wanted to discuss was, what if we, if we had the opportunity to design a mission whose first purpose is to search for technosignatures? Even though there's a lot of astrophysics that can uh, be done with these missions, as I will uh, explain. And one of the first things that comes to mind is, yeah, uh, as I said, space archaeology. Um, we can think about the traces that past civilizations have left in the universe. Because like I said, uh, the past is very long and it's, um, um, it's like, you know, um, exploring the, the, the universe in search for something like ancient artifacts. It's probably something that will, um, uh, let me put it another way. There's probably many more extinct civilizations than uh, current uh, extant civilizations right now. And one of the reasons to do this space archaeology in our own solar system, in our own neighborhood, is the following. If you think about, the, about it, the uh, stars in the galaxy, they are not in fixed positions. They move around and sometimes um, uh, star zoom past uh, the solar system, getting very close, closer than one light year. Um, these type of close encounters occur uh, typically on time scales of 100,000 years, 10 to the 5 years. Um, and this, if you think about it, it, it's actually a fairly short time scale. It means that over the course, over the lifetime of the solar system, there's been 45,000 encounters, 45,000 times a star has passed within one light year from the sun. The last one actually was a Schultz star, which happened 70,000 years ago. This uh, star penetrated the Oort cloud 70,000 years ago. And this is, this is very, um, very intriguing because there were already human beings on this planet 70,000 years ago. This is an artistic representation of uh, a, a human being looking at this star. This is wrong because the, the Scholl star will not be visible to the naked eye. It's, uh, it would have been about magnitude 12, but it's uh, certainly a very inspiring picture when you uh, look at it this way. So if you think about it, we have Alpha Centauri, it's about four light years away from us, and we are thinking about sending a probe there. Um, now, imagine if we had a star within one light year, 
we would be very much motivated to send probes to it. And these flybys, they are not an instantaneous thing for for the, you know for human time scales. A, time, a flyby will last for centuries. So we will probably be sending lots and lots of probes to that uh, passing star. So there's been 45,000 opportunities for um, a star that has a civilization to come close to the solar system and send potentially lots of um, probes into our solar system, which might still be um, somewhere uh, waiting for us to find them. And this is the, the motivation for some of the uh, artifact search in the solar system. The, probably the, the ideal place to search for such old artifacts will be the surface of um, will be old surfaces, surfaces that not have uh, suffered of erosion and deg degradation like uh, you have on Earth. You have a lot of erosion, a lot of uh, activity. So it's, it's very difficult that something that happened uh, a million years ago will still be there. But we have places like the moon, for instance, um, and, and some other old surfaces where you could hope to still be able to find something that was left there, something that crashed. And so um, there's going to be a, a talk by Joe Lassius uh, later today. But um, let me just say that one of the things that we discussed in that meeting is that we should probably have an exploration mission for the lunar surface, something similar to the, um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO. Um, is constantly orbiting the moon and producing images which have between 50 centimeters and 2 meters per pixel. Um, but the, not all those images can be beamed back to Earth. So LRO uh, produces a monthly map of the moon with a resolution of 100 meters per pixel. Okay. Um, what we would like to do is have something similar to this, but that uh, maps the moon at a resolution of about 10 centimeter per pixel. This can be done with a uh, 40 centimeter telescope. Um, you get a resolution of 0.4 arc seconds, uh, and you will require integrations of about 10 to the minus four seconds. This is limited by the motion uh, uh, of the of the um, the surface during the time you're acquiring your observations. But the point is. Just the reason why LRO doesn't send all this information back to Earth is because it's, it's too much. You don't have enough telemetry to send all this back to Earth. That's why the final map has this resolution. But what we propose is not to send all this information to Earth, but to analyze it on board with AI and look for anomalies. Okay? You don't want um, to make a map of the moon with a 10 centimeter resolution, but you could look at the moon with a 10 centimeter resolution, identify anomalies, and then uh, send back to Earth the anomalous data. I think the key here is to search for anomalies. Uh, we are at a point where the geology of the moon and other surfaces is, is uh, mature enough that we, we know the basic processes, uh, but it's the anomalies that is important, that is interesting, and that will make you advance your science. And it's the anomalies that will also reveal any possible uh, alien presence uh, in the past. There's, there's a very, um, very pioneering works, like uh, the, the group of Daniel Langerhausen, that have done this with the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter data. And they found uh, things like the uh, Apollo landing sites. The, their neural network looks at these uh, images and can find the tracks of the rovers and the landing site are identified as anomalies. You don't have to tell the AI what to look for. It learns uh, just by looking at all the images what is normal, and then it will identify anything that is not normal. That's what you're looking for, the anomalies. Um, another interesting place to, to look for artifacts is the asteroid belt. Um, the, the proposal is to use polarimetry. Uh, polarimetry is a fascinating technique that has the advantage for our purposes that basically metallic surfaces will stand out very clearly in polarimetry against the background. So if you can send uh, a mission to the asteroid belt and look for objects about 10 meters size, um, you, can, you can explore a range of about 0.02 AU around your probe. Um, and with our current knowledge, which is very limited, we don't know a lot about the distribution of uh, small uh, objects this small, but with current uh, knowledge, 
If you send a mission to the asteroid belt within 0 0.02 AU, there's about 250,000 objects um, that are 10 meter or larger that you can explore. And you can do polarimetry and identify um, metal surfaces. You could also identify ice or salt deposits, which is also interesting from the science point of view. Um, it might be interesting to do something similar with the Jupiter Trojans, because Jupiter is like a giant fishing net. Uh, if something is wandering around the solar system, it's going to be captured by the Jupiter gravitational field. Um, but it's more difficult because being far from the sun, uh, the objects there are fainter. So you, you are more limited in, in terms of how much you can explore. And also, uh, in, uh, Joe uh, Lazio will tell us later that the stability times are not so uh, long. The time scales are not so long. So maybe um, the, um, the, you know, any, any uh, possible alien artifact will not remain there for a sufficiently long time that uh, we would be able to see them. But it's just another thing that could be explored. Uh, NEOs, near-Earth objects, uh, just because they, they, are, they are a good platform to observe the Earth, so um, we should look uh, closely at NEOs, um, uh, because if an alien civilization uh, passed nearby, they might have uh, used these objects as, a, as, a, as an observing post to, to observe Earth. Now, going beyond our neighborhood, uh, just for the last couple of minutes, um, it's very interesting to look for uh, laser pulses, uh, for laser signals, uh, as well as radio signals. There's the Panosetti project that you, you all are probably fa familiar with uh, to search for laser pulses, because basically with laser you can, you can uh, transmit information throughout the galaxy. Um, and uh, the idea is that from space you can search not only in the visible range but also in the infrared. Um, you would need very fast detectors to go down to the nanosecond uh, regime. And of course, the sky has never been observed at this uh, time resolution. So I'm sure there's, um, there's a lot of new astrophysics that will emerge from uh, these observations. Um, the infrared is uh, is very important for uh, in the search for techno signatures because all of these large uh, mega structures that have been discussed they basically transform visible light uh, from the star into waste heat that's basically what life does right life um, life does work and work creates heat and you know a lot of life or very advanced technology uh, can produce will produce a lot of work and, and that amount of work will translate into a lot of heat. Um, and we should look for the infrared signals of that uh, waste heat. Um, there's been missions in, in the past uh, that have not been designed specifically to search for this kind of, of signals. Um, and, and there were some limitations. Uh, the, there was a problem of the infrared cirrus that was uh, found, discovered by the IRA satellite. Um, and so there are some ideas of how uh, a future infrared observatory could be optimized to search for Dyson spheres or megastructures around other stars. And, and I would like to conclude just, just basically pointing to uh, Zhu Tin Chang's uh, presentation on the idea of a large radio telescope uh, on the moon, because the moon is the most radio quiet uh, place in the solar system. In the solar system, not, not near Earth. Um, and th there's, I'm sure um, Zhu Tin will, will discuss this. But um, it, it's an ideal place to do this and, and other studies. And I think my time is up. Um, but but it's, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, some of the exciting things that can be done from space. And I think uh, that's the, the future of technosignature research. Thank you.